I think most people could agree that one of the most important innovations in recent years in deep reinforcement learning is the use of experience replay. This is, of course, one of two innovations that help deep Q learning to beat, in some sense, uh, the human level metrics in the Atari library. Now, the basic idea is that the agent is going to take its experiences that it encounters along the way and store them in some buffer that it can later sample randomly, uniformly to sample the parameter space and to perform batch gradient descent on its deep neural network. Now, there are other approaches to this and to which we have hindsight experience replay. Now, the idea here is that we want to get even closer to how human beings learn. Now, you and I, we may start out with some goal in mind when we're learning, like we want to implement a paper. We may want to learn a new programming language. We may, we may just want to ride a bike if we are a small child. Now, the idea is that you have some goal state in mind, and then you are working towards that goal state, taking actions, receiving feedback, and then ultimately comparing your output to your mental model of that goal state. And hindsight experience replay extends this concept to deep reinforcement learning. In particular, we have environments uh, where we have some, in this case, robotic arm that wants to manipulate an object in its world. That object is described by some three-dimensional position, and it has a goal three-dimensional position that it wants to place that object in using a variety of different actions. You know, it can push, it can pick it up and place it, or it can even slide it across a table to achieve that position. But it's constantly comparing its uh, desired state of the world to what is actually achieved. Now, this introduces a problem. In general, we give the agent a reward only for achieving that goal state. So these rewards are sparse so, because the agent isn't going to achieve that state by random chance very often. It's going to be pretty rare. So the vast majority of your experiences in your replay buffer will have no reward. This makes it very difficult to have a signal for the deep neural network to key in on to figure out what is expected of it. Now, in humans, we can learn from something called hindsight. We can say, when reviewing our memories of some activity, we can say, you know, this would have been successful had we done X, Y, Z, or had the environment, the cir circumstances around our action, been ever so slightly different. In the paper, they give the example of like a hockey, like a hockey puck going into a net. You know, if your shot misses to the right, well, then you know that had the net been a little bit to the right, then your shot would have worked. So that's important information. You're able to learn from hindsight. You can say, okay, in that situation, I can adjust my behavior. I can adjust my output in some kind of way to achieve the desired goal. So the core innovation in hindsight experience replay is that we're going to save our replay buffer with not just the states, actions, rewards, new states, and terminal flags, but with the... Um, goal states that we were attempting to achieve along the way. Now, of course, the goal state is typically um, given to you at the beginning of the episode because the position of uh, wherever you want to place the object is fixed. However, there are other strategies for coming up with other goals different from that initial goal that allows you to actually generate a reward signal to help your agent to learn. So let's take a look at an example from the paper. So they have here a rather trivial environment where they have just a sequence of bits that they want to flip. So they call it the bit flip environment. And in the course on hindsight experience replay, this is something uh, we implement together and actually reproduce uh, their results. Now, the idea is that you have some n bit system and it starts out in some random states of zeros and ones. And then you have a randomly selected initial, uh, initial goal as well, also described by some set of zero and ones. Your action state is an integer and it's to flip the ith bit. So if the ith bit is zero, you flip it to a one. And if it's a one, you flip it to a zero. And so by flipping bits, you eventually match the goal state. Now, if you look at this plot here, uh, you can see that the DQN performance falls off pretty rapidly. It falls off at around 12 to 13 bits. So that means that its success rate drops precipitously to zero as the number of bits goes beyond 12. And if you take a look at the blue plot, you can see that DQN plus hindsight experience replay actually manages to solve it all the way up to 50 bits. Now, why is this? Now, it's not because there is some lack of states for it to explore. There is a huge number of states, two to the n number of states, right? So it's a rather large number of states for n equals, you know, 32, 36, whatever. So it's not in a lack of variety of states. The issue is that the agent for large n will never experience a reward. So it never has anything to learn from. And so there is a very clever trick using hindsight that we can use to 
uh, actually introduce a reward signal to teach the agent how to achieve some arbitrary state even without never having observed it in real interactions with the environment. The idea is we're going to store our batch of memories with the original goal as well as some other goal. Now there are a number of options for how to select these other goals. The most obvious of which being whatever state we ended up in, we can select that goal as our, we can select that state as our goal. So we can say, okay, I meant to end up in this state, but I actually ended up in some other state. We'll just pretend I wanted to end up there. I meant to do that, okay? And the agent gets a reward for achieving that final state, no matter what it is. And so at least one state out of the episode gives you some amount of reward signal. And so every time you play an episode, the majority of rewards are zero, but some of them are going to be a one. So if you sample a large enough batch size, at least one or two of your memories will have a reward for the agent to key in on. Now, one other solution you could use is something called reward shaping. Now, they point this out in the paragraph here, where you could take the distance between the state and the goal, right, in some space, in some vector space. Now, that would work uh, in principle. They investigate a little bit more detail later, but the idea is that the uh, reward is in negative proportion to the distance of your goal state and the current state of the environment. And that could work in principle, but the issue becomes it's very brittle. How would that re shaped reward translate to a new environment? How would that concept, how would that solution actually play out in other non-trivial environments? And the answer is it doesn't really. And in fact, it requires domain expertise uh, to be able to come up with good shaped rewards. They talk about this later in the paper, but in other cases you had... Um, you had shape rewards that would have five, six, seven, ten terms, whatever, and those ten terms had to be, those n number of terms had to be very carefully crafted, which requires some amount of domain expertise. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm making a robot to lay bricks, I don't have expertise in bricklaying, right? I may have a fair amount of expertise in designing reinforcement learning systems, but none in, in laying bricks. So domain expertise uh, goes out the window very, very quickly when you consider real-world examples. And so the use of something like hindsight experience replay becomes even more important because it is generalizable. The agent actually learns something he can generalize to totally unseen states. It never has to see the goal state to get there. And it also can generate novel strategies for achieving some arbitrary state. So here is their hindsight experience replay algorithm. And this is what we implement in my new course on hindsight experience replay. Link in the description below. You have to start off with an off policy algorithm. That kind of goes without saying. Uh, if you're going to be swapping out goals and the goal is an input to the policy, uh, then it stands to reason the current policy you're training on is going to be different than the one you use to generate your experiences. So it has to be off policy. Of course, they use DQN for discrete action spaces for the bid flip environment and then deep deterministic policy gradients for the continuous action space environments. Uh, then you have regular reward, uh, excuse me, a regular um, experience replay and then a reward function that maps your goals to some uh, to some reward function relative to your states and then one difference compared to what we normally do in DDPG in DDPG and DQN we learn at each time step it's a temporal difference learning method but we use a type of update here that is more similar to what you would find in Monte Carlo based methods like say policy uh, vanilla policy gradients reinforce or reinforce with baseline but the idea is you're going to play over an episode uh, collect all of your experiences in some temporary buffer then replay that episode and for each step of your episode take the original goal and calculate some new set of actually achieved goals and calculate a new reward function. So then you're storing the original memory as well as your augmented memory with the hindsight experience replay goal as well. So you actually, um, you don't discard your initial experiences, you keep them, but you augment them with the hindsight experience replay goals. Then after you play an episode or some number of episodes, you can perform batch update on your deep neural network by sampling some mini batch of you know, 64, 128, 256 memories and feeding that to your deep neural network to perform your update. Now they came up with a variety of environments to test all of this. Uh, you can see it here. The basic idea is that there's a robotic arm moving around on a table. It's got a gripper. Uh, in some environments, the gripper is fixed so it can push the ball puck 
or block towards a goal, it can pick it up and place it in that goal, or it can slide it across the table into that goal. So three novel environments. Now this is using Mujoko, which I don't have a license for. Maybe you do. Perhaps you are an academic researcher. I do not. I didn't want to pay for it. It turns out there is actually an open source equivalent to this called Panda Gym. You can look it up on GitHub. It works really well. It has the same interface. It's set up exactly the same way to the Mujoko environment. And so if you look up uh, like OpenAI's code on this and try to implement it using their Panda Gym environment, you won't have to make any changes. It has parity one-to-one. -one. So it's very, very useful. It's an excellent open source library. I highly recommend you check it out. Then they go on to talk about states. You know, we already talked about that. In the case of the robot, it's joint positions, joint velocities, ball pos um, object positions and object velocities. Goals correspond to three-dimensional positions of the object in the world that you want to achieve uh, with some tolerance. You don't have to get it exactly in. It's like horseshoes, hand grenades, and nuclear weapons. Close enough is good enough. Uh, then you have a reward function that just maps. It says, okay, is the position within the tolerance? If yes, give the agent a reward. If no, give them... Uh, a reward of negative one. That's something I didn't mention is that the rewards are either negative one or zero. So uh, if you don't get within the tolerance of the position, you get a reward of negative one. And if you do, you get a reward of zero. Everything is randomized at the start. Uh, action spaces are pretty straightforward. It's just, hey, move your arm. And then they have multiple different strategies for sampling additional goals for hindsight experience replay. Now here in this plot, you can see the results. You, the red curve is DDPG plus her uh, hindsight experience replay using the best known strategy. We'll talk about that momentarily. And the blue curve is using the final strategy. That's the one I talked about earlier where we say whatever final state in the environment we end up in, we'll take that as our original goal and use that to augment our experience replay. Then we have uh, two other curves, the red dotted and the solid green. So the red dotted is just vanilla DDPG, and that doesn't really solve anything. And then uh, the green is DDPG plus count base exploration. Now that is related to curiosity, which we also talk about on the Academy and the Intrinsic Curiosity course. But the basic idea is we're going to discretize our state space, divide it up into little boxes, and every time the agent visits a new box in that state space, we're going to give it a reward. And the more times the agent ends up in that box, the smaller the reward we are going to give it. So we're going to at first encourage exploration, then over time discourage visiting previously seen states. So that way it keeps seeking out new and novel states of the environment. Uh, and you can see that the green curve generally does very poorly except in the sliding environment. And then in the pick and place, uh, only hindsight experience replay is able to solve anything. And there's virtually no difference between the two strategies. Although in my own testing and what we discover in the course is there does seem to be a bit of a difference in the pick and place environment. Um, that could just be down to the choice of hyperparameters or random seeds. I'm not entirely certain. Now, they do some ablation studies, and uh, they talk about the single goal case. Um, and one thing that sticks out to me here is the vast difference in DDPG plus count-based exploration. Now, this is something I have no explanation for. So if you take a look at this pick-and-place plot on the right, the green encompasses a large, large area. So it actually looks like in a single curve, single goal case, uh, meaning not using augmented rewards, I believe, that the uh, count-based exploration does actually really well. But why is that so different than up here where it does nothing? What is it that they're changing uh, between these two? You know, I don't exactly know. I don't understand exactly what they're doing. One other thing I did mention, and now that I'm kind of rambling here, it might be the case, is that they're using something... Um, Let's scroll up here. They base this on another paper called Universal Value Function Approximators. And that's the idea of inputting the policy, excuse me, inputting the goal to the policy. And so perhaps that's the difference between the two different plots to where here they're not inputting the policy, uh, the goal, and here they are. That could be the difference. And then that would actually explain why DDPG gets decent performance here because I skipped to doing the, ah, yes, I skipped to doing the, um, in the course, I input the policy from the, the goal from into the DDPG agent, and hence I get performance in line with this right here. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So then they talk about, you know, what if we combine, you know, reward shaping with hindsight experience replay? The results uh, actually turn out to be quite bad. So 
which is strange. You would think that if you do two things that make a lot of sense together, that you would get better results than doing one thing that makes sense, right? And it's not the case at all. You actually get significantly worse performance in all the environments. And the other thing they take a look at is the ratio of the augmented hindsight experience replay goals to the original replay goals, uh, original goals on the replay buffer. Uh, and so they investigate three other strategies, future. So in the future strategy, we're saying, um, what if we uh, take the current time step and then sample K number of states after that as uh, our hindsight experience goals? Uh, and the other one is the episodic strategy where we say, um, we're just going to take K random states from the episode as the transition being replayed. So they could come from the past or the future in that episode. And then random, we're playing with K random states encountered so far in the whole training procedure. So through your whole training buffer. So then if you take a look at the plot, you can see that the future and the episode strategy tend to do reasonably well. That's the blue, the red and the green curves. For all values of K, they do relatively well for in the pushing and sliding environment. Whereas the final strategy, of course, only has a single goal, so it's k equals one, it's just a straight line. And for some values, it's better than some of the strategies and worse than others. Uh, it's kind of in between. And then in the uh, random case, it really doesn't do well in anything except the pick and place, which is kind of interesting. So the key takeaway here is that you want K to be four or eight. So you want a four to one or eight to one ratio of hindsight augmented goals to the original goals in your replay buffer. And you want to stick to either the final or future strategies. So implementing the random and the episode strategies is trivial to do. It's not difficult at all. But you do want to stick to the final or future and K between four and eight. Finally, they want to flex on the broke boys. So they deploy the algorithm on a physical robot. Now, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, this kind of shows how things go play out in the real world. So taking the uh, as trained policy and deploying it on the robot, they got a success rate in two out of five trials, so 40%. Not too bad, but given the success in the simulated environment, you would expect it to have a 100% success rate. You kind of wonder why. Well, there are a number of, of reasons, and chief amongst those is noise. Real systems, real physical systems have noise. You know, the camera has some noise associated with it. The the motors in the robot have some slack. You know, all kinds of things can contribute noise. You get noise from the wall. If your electrical source is noisy, that's going to propagate to your system. It's very difficult to do noise. I actually did uh, low temperature measurements of microwave emission and nanostructures in my graduate program. And one of the biggest difficulties we had there was isolating and reducing noise because any amount of noise coming from your electrical source, ele other electronics in your room could contaminate your experiment. So that was something we had to be very mindful of. And it's good to know that it does play a role here in deep reinforcement learning. And so the solution to that is, of course, to retrain, uh, to kind of fine tune your model by introducing some noise into your observations. And then voila, what do you get? You get 100% success rate on a physical robot. So this is an example of deep reinforcement learning, training a physical robot to do something useful in the real world, like picking and placing, stuff like that. So Jeff Bezos, Amazon, if you're watching, take note. I'll be happy to implement this for you for the low fee of, say, $50 million. Uh, that's it from the paper. Um, they have, of course, a lengthy appendix where they talk about the number of parameters, things that they modify. And there are a number of modifications they do, like re uh, target clipping, input scaling, normalization, changes to the nor uh, exploration um, all kinds of different stuff, stuff they do, uh, multi-threaded training, which I show you how to do in a different way than we cover in the A3C videos. Uh, in particular, we use MPI, the message passing interface. So I cover all of the code to this, my own solution on the Neural Net Academy. This was my first new course for my platform. Uh, if it's something that interests you, by all means, check it out. Otherwise, um, I have to actually upload the code to GitHub. You can take my synopsis of the paper and combine it with the uh, GitHub code and probably figure it out for yourself if you're that kind of person. If you want to save yourself the time, by all means, check out my course. I hope that was helpful. Uh, um, please leave a subscribe if you've made it this far. Leave a subscribe? No, please subscribe if you've made it this far. Leave a comment uh, and hit that thumbs up button and I will see you in the next video.